Now that we've talked about geography and the scientific method, we go to our first case study and talk about the Earth's shape, and then eventually its size, and also finding locations on Earth. And so our song for this lesson and lecture then aptly is hopefully Around the World by Daft Punk. Because the first question we could ask ourselves with the shape of Earth and, you know, is this question that I asked you to open this module and the first, you know, there's, there's two parts of not only what is the shape of the Earth, which hopefully you had a pretty immediate answer for, but also, you know, really prompted by that scientific method question more. The second part, you know, it's really what I want to focus on here is how do we know Earth's shape, right? And so hopefully most of you can pretty quickly say, yes, I, I know that the Earth is round or that it's approximately a sphere or something to that extent, um, as would, would be what I would expect you to say when you're coming into this course. But, you know, as I explain out in the lesson, um, you know, I both want to sort of emphasize on the scientific, you know, dig deeper and, and focus on the, the scientific aspect of, of grounding that and how do we know that from the scientific method and you know, what information does the scientific method provide to us. And also, because contextually in society today, we're seeing you know, this re-rise of an idea that the Earth is not round or not, is not a sphere, um, but is flat. And so what I want to you know, point you towards, I'm not going to go through extensively here in this audio section, but you know, point you to this link that I have here um, and you know, gives you 10 different kind of little science experiments that I've been done in different, you know, they essentially could provide 10 different ways that we you know, know that the Earth is not flat or again, that based on that scientific method, ways that the scientific method has falsified this hypothesis that the Earth could be flat. Um, and so, you know, again, has not necessarily proven, quote unquote, to say that, you know, that the Earth is round, but, you know, has not been able in all of those ways to disprove that the Earth is round, rather, you know, as Dan disproven that hypothesis, hypothesis that the Earth could be flat. So again, I, I point you to that link and the different, 10 different ways um, on those 10 different hypotheses and methods of experiments that have been done in that way uh, of disproval for this hypothesis that the Earth is flat. So we'll take kind of from there that the Earth generally is round or, you know, again, as a sphere. But if we want to be more specific or uh, to say what we would call be more scientifically accurate uh, to the actual shape of the Earth, the Earth, if we move in the direction of, of accuracy, is actually closer to what we would term an ellipsoid or a sphere, if we think of a sphere being a perfectly three-dimensional round you know, uh, surface with no uh, deformation to any of the surfaces, kind of you know, this perfect uh, roundness to it. Um, you know, an ellipsoid still has that kind of perfect roundness outside part to it, um, but is a sphere and, and, and the, that has been deformed in at least one, if not multiple, dimensions of a three-dimensional space or three-dimensional reality as, as we live in. Um, and so I know I realized that the, this, in, this figure that I have shown below just kind of drawn up real quick is only in a two-dimensional way, but if we imagine it in, th in three dimensions, really what I'm just trying to show here is Earth actually, um, as I explained throughout the lesson, uh, in, in writing more detail there, um, I explained there how this image that we see, you know, we have the, this bulging out, um, kind of uh, what we'll come to later term, the equator, and kind of flattening in at the what we generally term to be the poles of Earth, uh, the North and South Pole. And so we'll explain, we'll get to why that all is actually in the next module, um, but just to note, you know, this is actually through measurements that we've obtained over time, um, through technologies we have to do those measurements now, we have you know, really found out that this is actually the case. But then to be even more accurate, we should note that we can approximate Earth with a model that is called the geoid because, again, with even further measurements and understandings of our Earth, we've come to realize that that um, the Earth, again, not being truly spherical, not even being truly really, really represented by this ellipsoid, we, we, we found that you know, Earth in certain places has to actually tends to have a lot more gravitational pull than we would 
by an average default expect. In other places, I have much weaker gravitational pull than you know, we would expect. And so there's kind of this spectrum, and that's what's being shown by this image here. So we have these red, or areas that are kind of around the right hand side, these yellows and reds, that are showing areas that have a stronger gravitational pull in those specific areas. And oftentimes, that's places where there's some mountains. So we see this turn out in the Andes Mountains, in much of mountainous area in North and South America, as well as the Himalayan Mountains, uh, the large world's tallest mountain range in Asia. And some of these places where we have mountains are some of the high, or, or where we have the stronger gravitational pull uh, than normal. And then conversely, often a lot of the lower gravitational pull are either in depressions on low land or uh, in oceans. And so again, this comes to the spectrum, um, and we use that to uh, draw what we call this geoid. And so you can check out the what is sea level video that I've also linked in lesson three, and that gives a good quick few minute explanation on all of this and the geoid. Um, because generally here, you know, the ellipsoid is, you know, would be that perfect, kind of would have no deformation to the outer shape of it. The geoid generally tracks more um, with in, in helping define what exactly is sea level, and also generally has a pretty good job at kind of approximating the Earth's surface as well. Um, so it's actually even better than is shown by this image that I have linked here, where it also would do a pretty good job at matching up with the Earth's surface um, because it takes into account those gravitational components that we just looked at on the last slide. So again, I have to point you a little bit more to the lesson as well. Once again here, um, you can read more about the geoid and some of the links that I provided you there. Moving on then uh, beyond that to Earth's size. Once again, um, I will largely push you to a little bit to the lesson uh, to read more about this and, and some of the detail that I provided you there. I'm going to do some basic statistics here in terms of circumference and radius of the Earth's uh, measure for measurements for the Earth. So uh, you know, just over 40,000 kilometers there for Earth's circumference, radius um, that I provided there, 6,378 kilometers. Again, that being from the center of the Earth out to Earth's surface um, a measurement. But to note that really that because of that flattening and bulging uh, that we had described a few flat slides ago, actually, you know, at the equ equator, um, and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute, at the equator we see actually a little bit larger of a radius and uh, a little bit smaller of the smaller radius at the poles if, if we go from the center of the Earth uh, to either the north or south pole. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, again, that Earth is not completely a, a perfect sphere, um, as we know, but rather has that, you know, more ellipsoidal type shape, and more specifically, you know, we define by the geoid. And so I define for you in the in the lesson. And I have one of the images uh, tied to this, that here in this slide, where actually this calculation, approximately, a little bit off, but pretty close, was actually made over 2,000 years ago now, uh, around 2,000 years ago now, by uh, a Greek named uh, Eratosthenes in, in ancient Greece. And so he was able to in shorthand, determine that over you know observation of a number of years, where one year he was in uh, the upper part of what we term present day Egypt, uh, so the upper part of the Nile River, um, and you know determined on um, you know, one specific day in the middle of summer that wow, like I can stand here at this well that is open, you know, a well that you would collect water from, and determined that oh wow, like I there's no shadow here at all. That's Know, an interesting observation. And then a number of years later, when he was at Alexandria, which is on the coast uh, of, again, present-day Egypt, um, but it is on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in, in Europe and North, a North Africa, he noticed that on that same day of the year, based on the Greek calendar, um, that's much like our own present-day calendar, um, you, you notice that actually in the city at Alexandria at the same time of day, there actually was a shadow cast by buildings and other kind of monuments around um, at that same time of day. And you couldn't understand, and you couldn't, it didn't seem mathematically feasible to him because, you know, in part he was really uh, grounded and based in, in doing some math mathematics. You couldn't understand how if he lived on a flat Earth, you should say, or a flat surface, that why uh, at the same time of year, at the same time of day, one place would not have cast a shadow and one in another location would. And so he actually came to this idea that it, didn't, it couldn't be possible that the Earth 
was flat, it, the Earth must be round, or you know, it must be some sort of sphere, roughly. And so he was able to uh, do some of the calculations that you see provided here, and had this rough calculation that again was pretty close to the present day measurements, um, pretty darn close to the present day measurements that we have provided here on the left hand side. So again, all that is more detailed out in the lesson, so you can go and look at that there as well. And so finally, then that brings us to another classic question. Uh, many of you probably are backseat uh, geographers and always asking, where are we? Um, are we there yet? And so the question is, well, where is there in this case? And, you know, and, and we'll draw generally, where are these locations? If, you know, anywhere, if we want to locate any specific uh, place on Earth or you have a specific location, uh, for anywhere across Earth's surface, and, um, you know, how do we go about assigning that? And so the system uh, that we that we use is known as the latitude and longitude system. So it divides Earth's surface up into this grid and is able to you know, assign essentially unique values anywhere ac across that grid in, in these two dimensions of latitude and longitude. So latitude in this case refers to an angular distance that is either north or south of the equator, and that was measured from, from the center of the Earth. And so the equator is defined as being at a zero degrees, um, and then either moving north from that or south from that, you increase in values until you reach either the North Pole at 90 degrees north or the South Pole at 90 degrees south. And so these latitude lines are also sometimes known as parallels um, because they parallel each other as we can see in this image here and we want to note that with latitude lines every degree is the same distance apart so it's about 111 kilometers or so um, from zero to one degree either north or south one degree to two degree and so on all the way up to 90 degrees you know, the distance between every full degree of line uh, of latitude is that same distance apart um, and so Note that, um, and also you know, just kind of stop here and question. You know, perhaps this might, hopefully, to some extent, you've been even um, introduced to latitude and longitude before. But to ask here you know, if there's any reason why parallels might actually be important to the state we presently live in. So, um, in Oregon, is there any reason why parallels actually are really important? And if you sit here and you think about that for a minute, hopefully maybe you can realize actually, you know, thinking about maybe the borders of the state, we look at this next image here and see, oh yes, you know, actually the line that draws the southern border between, you know, Oregon's, Oregon's southern border and the northern border of California or part of the northern border of Nevada with Oregon, both um, are, are, you know, that's all drawn along this the, the latitude line of the 42nd or 42 degrees north um, latitude or parallel line. And so um, note that you know, we have that and also um, there's other you know, state border lines that uh, are defined by other uh, latitude or parallel lines. So note um, actually the uh, for example, the uh, line the, the 45th parallel, um, divides, for example, Wyoming and Montana. That provides, or, uh, it gives Wyoming's northern border and part of Montana's more southern border. Um, and so, also, you, know, you can see by our image here, um, that, you know, there's oftentimes signs at the 45th parallel that'll tell you, oh, you're look, you're halfway between the equator and the North Pole. And so, there actually is even one of those in Oregon along Interstate 5. So if you, oftentimes if you're driving in between Portland, for example, uh, Portland or Salem and um, Eugene, um, or generally just driving along I-5 um, in Oregon, if you're around Salem area, is about where that 45th uh, parallel uh, sign is. So you can look for that next time you drive up and down uh, Interstate 5. Moving to longitude, again, now we're kind of flipping it around where angular distance is east or west of a point on the Earth's surface, as again measured from the center of the Earth. And this, um, these lines sometimes are also known as meridians, so these lines that connect all points of the same longitude. 
And note the difference here from latitude is that every degree um, here has the same distance apart only at the equator. So again, it's that same, pretty much same distance, uh, about 111 kilometers at the equator. But note that this decreases in width um, as meridians approach the poles, again, whether it's the North or South Pole, because all of those meridians are converging and come together at both the North and South Pole. Cool. So note that, you know, and uh, also differentiated from latitude, note that uh, meridians are begin or defined by what we term the prime meridian, once again, which we define as zero degrees, and that these meridians then increase up to 180 degrees, um, and so potentially all values between zero and 180 degrees, um, so anywhere from 1 to 179 uh, are, must be defined by an east or west designation, uh, whether they are east or west, um, by this de defined, again, originally from the prime meridian. So the question is, well, where do we put the prime meridian, or you know, does it matter where we put the prime meridian? Um, and so you know, if we look at all of our longitude lines, and they all connect up at the same place, you know, they're both defined by the poles, um, if we actually took them, we were able to kind of slice through them, you know, draw around, we'll say, for example, where we put the prime meridian, we put you know, on the opposite line, uh, uh, the, the 180 degree line on the opposite side of the Earth, that would actually cut the Earth uh, in, directly in half, and we can put that prime meridian essentially on any latitude in the line we find, and you know, end up that really it doesn't matter immediately where we put the prime meridian, it could actually essentially be anywhere. So if that's the case, well, then we should ask you know, or note that, um, first off, there is an internationally recognized prime meridian, which uh, officially is termed often to run through Greenwich, England, um, so which is there's an observatory there, you know, just outside of London, um, and England being part of present-day country of the United Kingdom. And so note really that actually was not established until the year 1884 AD with an international conference, which eventually decided on Greenwich. Um, but prior to that, um, really a number of countries, many countries across the world, um, as we think of them today at least, um, mainly the United States and many European countries at the time, actually all had their own prime meridians, ran them through oftentimes their capital cities, use them in maps that they produced for their own um, you know, um, navigators and people who are doing trading. Um, but the problem further and further through the 1800s, um, especially when um, as we drew towards the eventual convening of this international conference that decided on one single international prime meridian, was a problem of transportation and trading and just like it was you know, the, some problems of um, you know, essentially where you set your prime meridian then not only determines the maps and you know, makes essentially any maps with different prime meridians unable to be compared to each other and, and you know, used necessarily immediately for navigation or you know, um, trading, but also that oftentimes is used to set time, as we'll come to see in the next module, you know, how we define uh, what is day and night and like how we set our clocks. And so you know, the problem became everybody had different clocks and it became super confusing of who was on what time. And so um, there was a, kind of a move with this international conference not only to establish an international meridian, but also uh, to establish an international kind of set time that everyone operated on and, and used time zones, as we'll come to, again, describe more, talk about more in the next module. All that to say, um, you know, I explain this all out as well within the, um, le the lesson that you'll be working on in tandem with this video to note that you know there are many reasons uh, why uh, why this um, why Greenwich ended up being chosen, um, but probably one of the main reasons was a kind of a historical artifact as well from the time that Great Britain at the time having a, a world empire that stretched across and had many colonies across the world and really had the strongest navy um, and since at this time the ships um, were still the main mode of transportation for a lot of trading between countries. And Great Britain was able to use its leverage of having a very, the most powerful navy far and away in the world. They kind of argued that its 
Prime Meridian that it had been using should also be designated across the world. So, back to, once again, I'm going to wrap in wrapping up with latitude and longitude and keeping them straight. It's making sure to note, you know, oftentimes students can get quite confused with say, whoa, 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 latitude, longitude, they sound so similar, I'm trying to remember which one is which. Um, one um, mnemonic oftentimes that is used is latitude is like flatitude. So, you see by our image here, the latitude lines lay flat before at least looking in the earth kind of a directly up and down um, way that we normally think of it. Um, and so the latitude lines lay flat in front of you while the longitude lines run long up and down. Um, so that's just one way you can try and keep them straight. So once again, um, just to reemphasize, we have that um, up to 111 kilometers or practically 70 miles or so between each degree of latitude. Um, and again, that varies for longitude is at the greatest at the equator and gets smaller towards the poles. You know, how do we deal with that, you know, if we're only dealing with whole numbers from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 and all the way up to 90 or 180, in those cases of latitude and longitude respectively, how do we determine all the, you know, how do we give a um, location to all of those places in between those lines? And so this is where we can use uh, one of two different systems. There's the degrees, minutes, seconds system, so that uh, more uh, breaks everything down into beyond degrees both minutes uh, and seconds so there are 60 minutes in any one degree and also then 60 seconds within any minute so we can have a much more specific uh, designation of where a location is um, and so I have an example here um, where you, you can break this down uh, I believe this is the Eugene example where we have 44 degrees 3 minutes 7 seconds north 123 degrees 5, 5 minutes and 12 seconds west uh, as our designation here, and so that will show you, uh, or that gives you a much more um, you know, accurate um, location rather than just using degrees for both um, latitude and longitude. Similarly, that can be converted or used separately in a, in a different system that instead of the minutes and seconds uses uh, decimals, so in this decimal degree system, um, that we have the same or equivalent uh, noted here of um, for both latitude and longitude. And so note that um, when sometimes when decimal degrees are used, so for example, I also talk about this in the, in the lesson, that for example, if you want to go and plug these numbers into say Google Earth uh, or Google Maps or other, some other web services that you know, have, have world maps and for just you know, locating places, note that um, usually the north and east locations are set as positive values and that south and west are set as negative values so I have this you know here that to locate Eugene in say for example in Google Earth you would want to type in that 44.052 for latitude which usually comes first and then separated there by the comma the negative 123.068 because Eugene is in the western hemisphere so generally you know, it's always keeping track of these rules that um, we had gonna only have up to 60 minutes in a degree, 60 seconds in a minute. Latitude varies between 0 to 90 degrees north and south, and longitude uh, varies between 0 to 180 degrees east or west. And so we'll take this then into the next lesson and, and lecture, where now we're going to be moving um, for actually thinking of Earth as a three-dimensional, roughly sphere, or you know, up down to that geoid, geoid, and more specifically then moving towards maps and depicting Earth on a two-dimensional surface. Um, so we'll talk about why that we do that and some of the limitations and you know, limitations and benefits of doing that in our next lesson.